<laughs> so of course, it's pretty hard. It's not exactly easy to go after this talk by Jan. And Jan start, started by saying that he had done some physics. So I'm not, of course, a machine learner. I'm not even a physicist. I'm worse. I'm a mathematician. But uh, as you'll see in the next talk by Chiara, uh, there is, uh, we've, I've been now recently working with physics, which of course is a great thing, because, because then I can use the replica trick. <laughs> so, but here I'm concerned by something else. I, you know, in the last few years, in fact, this con this thing started in a, con a long time ago in a conversation with Jan, uh, when we were starting the Center for Data Science in uh, in New York. And after doing uh, an enormous amount of uh, administration to start this thing, I asked. I remember asking Jan, "Okay, but uh, what do you do?" And he told me his story, and then. I thought that there were a few things about landscape complexity that we could do from uh, the experience I had in, uh, let's say, rigorous spin glass theory. And so this thing initially was just an analogy, and now it has moved to something a little deeper. Um, and so I want to concentrate on hard problems. And pr you, you see, I say, which is worse, weak signal or, or entropy? I mean, both are terrible. So, uh, so, and I want so I want to concentrate on things that don't work really, and and when they do work. So, for that we have a we have a very nice uh, toy model, uh, not maybe not toy model, but workhorse, which is the uh, which is the spike tensor PCA, or tensor PCA or spike tensor model. So the so I will start with this one, and then go to something a little. Uh, um, maybe more interesting, which is the, the first uh, very, very beginning of neural nets, um, which is, let's say, generalized linear estimation type problems. And, and, and so, the, so, of course, in general, what we want to do is look at a, an empirical risk function. The parameter will be x. So uh, as I was mentioning yesterday, there is a big, big problem in this field that there are three dimensions and nobody agrees on how to write them, right? The dimension of the parameters, the size of the sample, and the dimension of the data. So here, let's say you have a loss function. Uh, okay, so that's the empirical risk function you want to understand. This guy is, of course, an IAD sample of some distribution, some data. Uh, this is the parameter. So my x will be in Rn. So, so n for me is what was d yesterday. That's the dimension of the of the parameter space. Uh, m is here the uh, uh, the size of the sample, and these xi are in some other space or other dimension. And you want to understand typically minimize this loss function. All right. So the uh, and of course I could denote by uh, r of x. The population, not the empirical, but the population risk, which would be the expectation of this guy. Which is, of course, the expectation of your L of x and x. All right, so the question is uh, how easy. So, uh, you know, if you remember what the Lenka was drawing yesterday, this uh, triangle, uh, here I'm. Um, Definitely not on the fancy two sides of the triangle. I'm on the basic thing, which was the, the, the lower side of the triangle, which was simply understanding optimization. Right? So I have, and of course, what the, the started this conversation, and in general, these functions, I, I look at it for me as a random function, because you have the randomness, of course, of the data in high dimension. And you know, random function in high dimensions could, uh, could very well be complicated and rough. So, the roughness is what I call the topological complexity, right? The topological complexity, what, are the, what is the topology? I don't know, the Betty numbers of the level sets. What are the number of critical points, number of minima? How rough is this thing? So a, a landscape could be complicated in that way, having, being rough, and everybody thinks of that, having lots of holes in which the system, let's say I'm trying to find the minimum of this, in which the system can fall, which are, uh, which are not uh, the absolute minimum. But in fact, are the critical points of this thing really important? Right? Everybody says no spurious minima, but how do we know even that this thing, when you minimize this? So you have this to minimize. You have this function, so you have the data for this. You have the, the loss function you've chosen. That's two things. Of course, you have all those dimensions. You also have a prior, which I, 
which is what you know, a priori. And, uh, and you try to, to see if this, minimizing this thing is easy. So one thing that jumps to the mind is that the landscape could be very rough. Another thing, of course, is that simply that the, another question completely different is having, does having a flat landscape, is it a good, somewhere, is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you listen to Jan, he will tell you flat is good. That's why we over-parameterize, right? Because flat means, you know, if you have a rough, if you, you cannot have a hole like this. Your hole tends to be flatter, or easier to find. What I will talk about here is uh, flat is bad, right? Really bad, but it depends where, of course. So, we'll, so wh when it's hard, when it's bad, it's. W so to uh, uh, x is theta, the parameter. Parameter. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe I should have called it theta if you want. There, are, this could be in another space. These are the data points. These are the data points. Yeah. So they are nothing. I mean. they, they could be. They could be in something else. Yeah. Could be in R D. So. So the question here is, of course, the problem of initialization, which I didn't put here. How do we initialize? And, and the question is that if you initialize just with a random start, then so the region of high entropy for your prior, um, it could very well be that if your landscape is too flat there, the signal is weak, and it's really hard to get out of there. right? So flatness there is complicated. Better good, you mean in terms of find accessibility? Yeah, uh, good means you, you can find easily. So there's another third thing, which is, of course, here the crucial thing, which is the time scale. The time you, you give your algorithm to find a minimum. Of course, if you're in physics and your random function is a spin glass, the, typically, of course, the, uh, the time scale will be enormous. And you don't care. That's nature. Here, you don't want, of course, your algorithm to run, for, to run for an exponential time. So we want short time scales. OK, so the question is short time scales. What are the things? The question I'm asking here are, what are the things that are really bad for the algorithm? And there are essentially, for the moment, I've only seen two possibilities. Maybe there are others. And these two are the ones I just mentioned very vaguely. The weakness of the signal in the region of maximum entropy, and possibly the roughness of the signal. Right? So. You know, so the problem with this, studying mathematically these two things seem to turn out to be uh, really a serious challenge. It's really difficult. So there are these two things. Roughness of the landscape. So that's a, you know, that's a, that's a geometric question, a static question. It's an energy. Like, uh, and you're asking, if, is this function complicated, the landscape being this function here? of this random landscape. And the second is the dynamics in it, or how do you move in it. So and the influence of the uh, weakness of the signal in the region of maximal entropy, which I have dubbed you know, escaping mediocrity. So this is the, the, the initial fa phase of your algorithm. So to study these two things are two completely different problems. Right? This is for physicists, this equilibrium dynamic, equilibrium question. This is really a dynamical question. And in a time scale, which has nothing to do with equilibrium, typically. Right? So and the, the, in fact, the two of mathematical tools are really have nothing to do with the, with the two. And in fact, it just happened that for both these questions, the, uh, there is one very good uh, model, which is this spike tensor. And the reason the spike tensor is a, and that, so I will talk first for the spike tensor and then maybe more recent result about the generalized linear models or estimation. So the, the reason this, uh, so these are the two things where we begin to be able to say something. The reason this one is doable mathematically is just because of the uh, symmetry group, which is uh, ON, the orthogonal group. And and this one is a completely different thing, but we will, I, I will talk about that. So let's talk quickly about the roughness of the landscape. I don't want to, to speak too much about that, uh, because in fact, Chiara will mention that in her talk after, after this one. So the question is, 
So first, maybe I should define with the, I will start with the spike tensor. So there's a huge literature, of course, on the spike tensor. For, uh, I'm not sure I have it completely, but for me, it starts with the, what I want to talk about starts with the, uh, with Montanari and Richard and Montanari in 2014. Then there's a huge literature on the side of uh, uh, semi-definite uh, programming, SOS hierarchy. Um, then a very nice paper by uh, Le Sieur Miolan, Le Large, uh, Florent, and Lenka. And, um, and I will try to summarize quickly what is known there. And I want to, the, the result I want to, the, the question about the roughness here are done in a, a paper of last year with, uh, uh, in what order? Song Mei, Andrea, and Michai Nika, and myself. Uh, and this is in CBAM last year, and another paper, which is with uh, Valentina Ross, Chiara Camarota, uh, Giulio Biroli, I forgot in which order is, okay, I'm not the last author, but whatever, and myself, where we, where we use the methods of physics. Here, this one is entirely rigorous mathematically. This one is exact, right? which means non-rigorous, but uh, you believe it. That's how I understand exact. Uh, so let me explain what, what that is. So first, what is the spike tensor model? And uh, so it's a, a very simple question. You have a, a small rank tensor. Let's say a small rank P tensor in dimension N. And you, and you observe it in a noised way, so a noisy way. So you have, let's say, uh, a rank one, that's the simplest thing. So you have this P tensor, and what you observe are this tensor plus Gaussian uh, tensor, and let's say you observe, so my data points here to take this notation uh, or something like this. Well, this guy is a uh, P tensor in dimension N with Gaussian entries all independent, the simplest possible one. Okay, and then of course you have to put somewhere normalization. So I will put a lambda here to indicate the signal to noise ratio. The largest is lambda, of course, the strongest the signal. And so to make sure that my normalization is are okay, uh, just put a square root of n here, or a one over square root of n here. All right, so you observe this, uh, maybe you observe m of these guys. And the question, of course, is to reconstruct, to, to first detect, and then maybe estimate V. OK? So that's a very simple problem. All right. So the, um, there are plenty of results on that, as I mentioned. So the, OK, so let me just uh, indicate here on the line. With this normalization, I think what I'm saying here is, is OK. Well, first, of course, in this question here, you can just reduce. You can take M equal 1. Because it's obvious, uh, as we will see in the, OK, maybe not now. Let me just, so let me take first, you know, of course, we can take m equal 1. When you do this, of course, and you do, I don't know, likelihood estimation, having, by just changing lambda, right, you can, uh, because these guys are Gaussian, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, just generalize to any m. So for the moment, I will just take one, I have one observation, but it's the same problem by just changing lambda. So, there are, so this is lambda, and there are different thresholds. So let me remind you what they are. So there's a very good summary of all this story in a paper about threshold by, uh, in 2016 by Lenk and, and Florent, which is called Statistical Physics and Thresholds. So exactly what we need here. And I just realized yesterday that the way we define the IT threshold is not exactly the same. But in this case, it's the same. So there's a, a first threshold here, where this IT threshold, which is 1, with natural normalization here. And so when you are here, right, so when your signal-to-noise ratio is too small, you can't do anything. You can prove rigorously that the distance, so this is really a strong statement, the distance between the distribution here, let me put it here, the distribution with the signal or without, 
are contiguous or too close. The distance in total variation goes to zero. Right? So there is nothing you can do. You cannot find an event that will distinguish them. Right? So there, forget it, you can't even detect that there is a signal. All right? In this normalization. Then, so of course you have to work above the threshold. When you work above this threshold, uh, okay, now you have to choose a statistical procedure. What do you want to do? So my initial title for the talk was Easy Does It, because I'm lazy. The only thing I want to do here is not learn about SOS, not learn about semi-definite programming, relaxation, smart algorithms. I want to do the stupidest possible thing. And the end of the story will be that it does exactly as well as the other one. So when you're above that, the only statistical procedure I really know is maximum likelihood. Right? So you take maximum likelihood, estimation for this guy, and you ask yourself, I try the maximum, you know, do I detect the signal? Do I recover something close to the signal or not? So there's another threshold, which in fact in this case happens to be, so this is the statistical threshold. I've chosen the statistical procedure MLE, I could choose something else. And it happened in this case, and this is an interesting coincidence, it's not a general fact, it just happens like this. A priori the statistical threshold is above this, in this case they're all the same. Right? So this tells you that the, if something works, MLE does it. All right? But then, of course, finding the, the maximum of the likelihood for this thing is a complicated optimization problem. So then you have to choose an algorithm. So now, depending on which algorithm you choose, you have a, whatever your algorithm is, or computational, you have another threshold probably and above which the algorithm will detect and maybe correlate with the signal and above and below it will not. It happens and we'll see that this, so what is, the question is what is this? And so this big computational to statistical gap, this is a nice model to study it, but it happens in a million other things and I'm sure you know that. So where do I, have, you know, for instance it happens in the stochastic block model, it happens in the planted clique, noisy transfer completion, high dimensional regression, and I could quote all the colleagues who have done that. Again, you find all this in this uh, review paper I was mentioning of Florent and, and Lenka. All right, so this is a good example. So this is why this problem is interesting for me. There's a huge gap here. We will see that this one diverges like a, n to the power alpha, and we'll discuss this power, where uh, between these two, a priori, the, you know that the maximum likelihood should give you the, the solution, but in fact, you don't, it, it doesn't. The question is, why is it like this? So first, of course, it depends on the algorithm you choose. So this goes back, in fact, to the initial paper I was mentioning of Montanari, Richard and Montanari in, uh, uh, five years ago. And so the signal here, the, the, the threshold for approximate message passing and many others, tensor unfolding, and many other smart algorithms is, is roughly of the order of P minus two over two, right? In the original papers that was not, initially it was not exactly proved like that, it was a P minus one over two, and then, but in the end this is the, the right threshold. So what I want to explain here is uh, what about, Again, you do the, 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 the stupidest thing you can do. You take maximum likelihood because you don't know any other statistics. And because I don't know any other optimization, you just do gradient descent. Can you explain what P matters? I, mean, I, don't, I don't understand. The P doesn't matter here, except that it has to be larger than three. If it's two, it's a matrix problem, which is much easier. Right? P, okay, in this, uh, okay. for any P, of course it, it matters here, but for any P, it, and you will see why. But for any P, uh, the problem is complex, as we see. As we see right? So uh, I want now to look at simple things like gradient descent, maybe Langevin dynamics, which are a gradient descent with uh, 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 noise, or maybe even stochastic gradient descent. And here I would take uh, stochastic gradient descent, but online, just to, uh, to see what this can do. So for these guys, the answer is, and this is recent work, the same. Okay, and so uh, this is a, a work that, uh, with um, Ukosh Jagannath. 
וזה הגיסרי, and גיסרי, and myself. And the fact that it works down to this goes back only one month or two. So the paper was posted in 18, but in fact, b initially we couldn't, we couldn't get there. We get, got to a p minus 1 over 2, but working a bit harder, we could do that. All right, so first this is good news in some sense. That is, trivial algorithm do as well as smarter algorithms. But here... Uh, First, of course, the real goal I had is that in this discussion with Jan, I asked him, but why do you do stochastic gradient descent? Of course, one reason was that it's uh, less computationally intensive. There's another reason, but he also had this movement of his hand. He would say, gradient stochastic goes around or something. So I'm still trying to find a situation where stochastic gradient descent does better or has something for it. At this point, this is not, this is not still in the paper. This is more recent, but... What this tells you is at least that stochastic gradient descent works as well as gradient descent and all the others, other type of algorithms here. And, but of course, the stochastic gradient descent is much lighter in terms of computational cost. All right, but now the other news. There's another threshold somewhere here, which is n to the p minus 2 over 4. And where... So this was, this come first with, uh, in, the, in fact, in the montana Riri short paper, but then more than later using the, uh, an SDP relaxation, a convex relaxation, relaxation, the sum of square at degree four algorithm. Uh, and you can work down to here. So this beats this seriously. These algorithms here are not plain vanilla like this. It's, uh, you have to really relax your problem, climb, and then solve it over there. Since then, in fact, there are quite a few other algorithms that, uh, like that which, are, which have also got to this threshold. For instance, the, uh, there's a recent work by uh, Chris Moore, Alawi, and, um, and, and Wayne, my, our colleague at uh, Courant, that does some kind of an interesting, I mean, gets to this threshold with a version of the Kikuchi hierarchy from statistical physics. And there is another way to get down there, which is way clo which is closer to these uh, uh, simple plain vanilla method, the gra gradient descent, which is the replicated dynamics, which have been introduced by uh, Chiara, Giulio, and Federico Ricita Tarsenghi, and uh, uh, she will probably show you something like that. All right, so that's that's the picture. It's a hard problem because you have this big threshold, and of course the question is, what about here? So there are proofs in lower bounds. Of course, that's the interest of the uh, SDP relaxation. And there are lower bounds indicating that this should really be optimal. You cannot really beat that. I don't understand this proof, so I believe them. But this is supposed to be. For me, you know, maybe there is something else you can do, which, which, which will bring you there. So why is this problem to be supposed so to be hard? Why do you call stochastic gradient if it's n equal 1? No, when m equal one, there is no stochastic gradient descent. <laughs> no. Now I give you a, a larger m, and you and you take one, you follow the gradient in the direct. Uh, but if m equal one, then you say. No, if forget that, so m equal one forgets stochastic gradient descent, of course. Okay, you just take gradient descent. So let me exp let me let me write the function that you want to minimize. So the or mag so. I so the function that you, the, the, the loss function, which is when you take the log likelihood, the MLE, will have the following form. Oh, and here I didn't say what I'm doing here. The prior will be simply, essentially no prior. That is, I take simply my parameter on the sphere. All right, so just the direction is nothing. Then what you find is that this, this thing here will be something, let me call it zero of x plus my square root of lam n lambda. <laughs> So because of the invariance by rotation of everything here, I can very well assume my spike v to be whatever I want, right? So for instance, I will assume it to be the vector 1 and all zeros, as I will call the North Pole. So here's a, pic a picture of the sphere in high dimension, which is, of course, a stupid picture. But uh, the, the North Pole will be here. This is v. This is the vector 1 and all zeros, OK? So if I do that, then here I will have an x1 to the p. And what is this? 
This is just a p-spin class, right? This is just with normalization that I don't care about. This is just, uh, th this was the noise, I1 IP, Xi1, Xip. Right, so this is really a spin glass on the sphere, spherical spin glass, we know it well. And then to it, you add this, right? So, you know, in physics, if instead of taking the one and all zero, if I, my vector was just made of all ones, right, this would, and, and if P was one, this would just be a magnetic field, essentially, right? And, um, and this is, and so P is one is a magnetic field. If P is two, this would be like adding a curie vice type uh, ferromagnet thing. And P three doesn't mean much in physics, but this is what you do here, all right? So let me look at it like a mathematician. This is a homogeneous, both are, I mean, this is a homogeneous polynomial of degree P. That's all it is. This is a random homogeneous polynomial of degree P, and this is just a very simple one. Okay, and I want to understand how the minimum, and of course, you have to look at the maximum by, by just changing the sign. I want to find the minimum of this thing. All right, so the first question about topological complexity is, and the first fact, this, this, this R of X can, is, I mean, can be, or is rather, topologically complex. Of course, a polynomial in degree P uh, in, in small dimension is of course trivial, but here is when the dimension is large. So what, this has been, uh, so the topological complexity when lambda equals zero is well understood. Okay, so by what, let me just summarize this very quickly. So this is in the paper with, that I mentioned with uh, this paper for the annealed version. For instance, you can compute simply the log, you, try to want, you may want to compute the log of the mean number of, let's say, critical points of this function uh, with values, let's say near a number, I don't know what, L, and uh, X1 and latitude, we'll call it the latitude is this X1 direction, so X1 is this coordinate, that's the latitude, and latitude close to X, close to whatever, U. Okay, you can do that. This object exists, this complexity exists. We, I don't know, S of L and U here, and can be computed exactly. You can also fix, you, you can ask this to be, if you add the fact that it's a minimum instead of just being a critical point, this also is computed in this paper and we call it S0. So you know this complexity thing, and this tells you the following story. So the story that this function, in, so this is, as you see, this is the anneal complexity, the log of the mean. What you're really interested in, of course, to put this outside, and this is done in the second paper with less rigorous methods. To do it rigorously mathematically is a huge pain. It has been done for the, uh, for the spin glass, when lambda equals zero, by Eliran Subag. It's really painful. But if you use the methods of physics, it's less painful. So uh, this you can compute, and what does it tell you? That this thing is, is positive. The number of local minima is exponentially large, and the story is simple. Let's look at it here. Around the equator here, so x1 is zero, this is a spin glass. The spin glass is exponentially complex. So here you have exponentially many of those critical points. What happens is that when lambda is too small, so the, the, the key to all this is a uh, methods in, in random geometry, which is called the Katz-Rice formula, which goes back 70 years or 80 years. And the Katz-Rice formula allows you to compute this thing. And it allows you to compute this thing in terms of the statistics of the Hessian of this function. The Hessian of this function, when you look at it here, is really nice. So the Katz-Rice formula transforms this problem of random geometry, compu computing the topological complexity, into a problem of random matrices. So it, tra it just transforms this problem into a problem of random matrix theory. But what is the random matrix here? What is the Hessian of this? Because of the orthogonal invariance, this the Hessian here will be a variant of the GOE, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And then you add a spike, you add a, something in this direction here. 
So it's a rank one perturbation. The Hessian is a rank one perturbation of the GOE. And this, these are extremely well understood, and it explains this first transition. So this comes usually under a, so this spike matrices problem are easy to understand in random matrix. Because the matrix is GOE, we know as much as we need to know on, random, on the random matrix side. And so this whole thing can be computed exactly. All right, and so this is what is done in this, uh, in this uh, work. And what do you see is something like this. Oh, let me explain it here. So when lambda is too small, the top eigenvalue of this Hessian stay, stick to the bulk. You don't detect the spike. This is exactly what happens when you are below the IT threshold. As soon as you're above the IT threshold, there is one eigenvalue that gets away from the bulk of the GOE matrix, which is a semicircle. And so what happens is that you always have an exponentially large number of critical points around the equator. The landscape is really rough here. And then at some point, you find something around a positive latitude here, above the IT threshold. And your minimum or maximum likelihood will be somewhere around here. There, the complexity is not exponential. It's marginal. Right? That is, the complexity is zero. So of course, then you expect, when lambda finite, if you have in this regime, you start from a random point. Now let's talk about dynamics. If you start from a random point, you will start from the equator. Because any point on, on the sphere is on the equator. And then you, question, you ask, will I go there? Right? Will I get to, the, to this thing? So here, there are two things. The com this landscape here is very complex, right? Exponentially many critical points, ready to trap the system, OK? But there is also something else, which is that this, the signal, the gradient, look at this function here, the gradient of your population risk, population loss, which is just this, the expectation of this is zero, so the population loss is this function, x1 to the p. The gradient of that vanishes on the equator when x1 equals zero. And when p is larger than three, it's Hessian two. Right? So the signal near the point where you start, that's what I call mediocrity, the signal here is extremely weak. So this, the landscape is really flat. The way you should think of it is that here, the landscape is really flat. The, this is the equator. This is where the signal is. It's really flat plus a lot of roughness, but the signal is really flat in the direction of the, and, and then of course, as soon as you begin to escape, if you did a hot start, if you start from here, then you will descend very quickly, right? So the real question is how can you, do you manage to escape? And if you can't, so when you are below the threshold I mentioned, then you cannot do that in finite time or in short time. And then after a while, you just wander around the equator and then you end up being trapped by the. So flatness for you is not in the ground state. What? No, no, of course not. No, of course not. The ground state is here. That's exactly the other flatness that Jan was talking about, the one you want to find. This one, of course, here has a well around it, but which is absolutely not flat. This one has a Hessian, which so this, there's a quadratic well around this. There is no flat direction around this one. So it makes it hard to find, in fact. Whereas when you start here, you start from a flat landscape, and you don't know where to go. And this is what explains, after a lot of work, this, uh, this threshold. All right, so that's uh, uh, this, this. So this question of flat region, of course, I'm not explaining. So the, the proof really of uh, of this uh, dynamical result with Okosh and uh, Reza with Jakarat and Gesari is really complicated. And, and the reason is that we are in high dimension. So we had to invent them I mean, to, to go after pretty painful new Sobolev inequalities independent of dimensions. And interestingly, the reason we could do that, in fact, is again because of the orthogonal symmetry. So the fact that we have the orthogonal group behind it helped tremendously. And by the way, analyzing the uh, stochastic gradient descent is also kind of painful in high dimension. Uh, stochastic gradient descent has been analyzed since the 50s, but in finite dimension. As soon as the dimension diverges, it becomes a also a little of a serious problem to analyze that. Okay. All right, so this tells us this uh, threshold. In this region, the, uh, this gradient descent or Langevin dynamics will not work. But now let me say something, which is, so. So the matrix has to be carried. So when you say analyze stochastic gradient, you mean an online version? Online version, yes, online version. No, no, I don't, I, for the moment. Yeah, just the, the, the stupidest possible online gradient descent, yes. So what is really the role now of this? So you, you all understand the gradient, when p is larger than 3, 
the gradient and the Hessian of this near a typical point are, don't help, right? So it takes, it's difficult. There's a tiny push, but really small, right? So it, it's really, really uh, difficult to capture this to go, and that's why you need a very large lambda. Of course, when your lambda is very large, what happens is that this parallel in which you end up comes very close to the, to the signal. Right? And there, there is no complexity. So the real question, and of course, you would not see anything of this if you, get, if you started with a hot start. Right? This would then be a very simple problem. The difficulty here is really to escape the entropy when the signal is small. But then, is the roughness really important? So first, it's not important in this regime when you end up here, because then your thing will be essentially become trivial. When, the analysis uh, I, I give here was a fixed lambda. When lambda diverges, it's a different story. But something else in the path, so what, what we can see is that if you look at the path of your, let's say, Langevin or gradient descent, once you've escaped, or even once you're in the equator, you never come close to a critical point. So the situation is this super complexity is painful it, if it can kill you because you stay too long. But otherwise, when it succeeds, it's just by completely ignoring it. The trajectory does not, the gradient, the norm of the gradient is bounded below in the right normalization, right? So you never come close to something. You never come close to the problem. It's not a spurious minimum there. Or, or even a critical point, even a saddle point. You just zoom, right? So it's a, when it works, so it's a little disappointing. When it works, it works trivially. You know, what doesn't work, it just wanders around and get stuck, right? OK, so that's the story in words. Of course, there are quite a bunch of papers around that. And, uh, and of course, uh, Chiara will. Uh, but, but the entropy itself is originated by the critical point. So no, no, not at all. Not at all. This is wrong. In fact, you could, let's say you take Langevin. You, you, you take this here, the, the right width. It's just that when you take a point on the sphere, it is on the equator. Right? whichever equator you choose. And then, if you even decide, we try that. You just erase completely the landscape there. Right? You kill H0. You still will not escape it. Right? The, so the entropy here is really due to the entropy of the sphere. What the, what the topological complexity adds is that because of this entropy, this needle in a haystack thing, that you have to wander around with a very weak signal bringing you to where you want to go, so it's not exactly the needle in a haystack, but almost. Then after a while you hit, so we then you hit a hole and then you hit a trap and then you get there. So we prove, in fact, in this paper on the refutation side that the time to do is at least exponential square root n. All right. Now what about so there's another possibility of the, the importance of uh, complexity. It's a, a more complicated model, which more interesting model. Take this one. Change the degree. This is the polynomial of degree p and this was of degree k. K. So we introduce, of course, this model is not directly an inference model immediately. So that's what we call the P plus K model in the paper with uh, Chiara, Giulio, and Valentina. And then since then, there is the problem of the P and K model that has been analyzed by uh, uh, Lenka, Florent, and Chiara. Chiara, Giulio. OK. So but anyway, so let's look just at, as an optimization problem. right? So the one that I was just mentioning is K equal P. When k is not p, then the story about the complexity is a little different, but in the same spirit. For instance, when k is smaller than p, here you have exponential complexity 2. But also, you see, when your k is smaller than 2, then smaller than 1 would be even more drastic. But when k is smaller than 2, then here the gradient may be 0 at the equator, but not the Hessian, not the second derivative. The second derivative has feel the direction of the spike. So this problem, when, so we also do that with uh, Okosh and Reza, when, when you take a k smaller than 2, then you don't need this super high uh, signal. You don't have this gap, because you can escape very easily. All right? So in this regime, in fact, you, this proves in some sense that this complexity, and this, the complexity around the equator is still there, because this function is still very complex. So suddenly you have enough gradient and Hessian, whatever, to push you away. And then, you don't, you, then the signal-to-noise ratio is completely different. And, but then now it's interesting. Because then now, when k is smaller than 2, you escape, you get there. Now you have complexity there. 
Now your landscape is complicated there. It doesn't matter that much because it, maybe your minimum is in the middle of this band and you will probably get stopped at the bottom of the band when you come from here. So you lose a little bit in performance, but that's not crucial. All right, but the, here you see exponential, comp you, you see the role of com topological complexity when you get there. All right, so this model is analyzed dynamically also in the same paper and statically in this, in the, in this work with uh, uh, Julia and Chiara. So now this is nice, but so the uh, t tensor model is cool because you can compute because of this orthogonal invariance, which allows you to have a nice random matrix problem and also a nice uh, PDE type problem. But now, what about more general thing? Of course, what I would, everybody would want to see here is something, a loss function, which would be closer to a neural net. So this is way further. For, mathematically, this is completely unachievable right now. But you can think like this. What is, in random matrix theory, there are only two classes of models in which we know what to do. One is the GOE type, the Wigner type. And the other is the Wishart type or Pastor-Marchenko type, the sample covariance matrices. So what are the good models that correspond to this? That's in fact simply generalized linear model. Generalized linear estimation or models, whatever. So this is a work in progress. And so let me just explain what this is. It's, it, it may have different names, but uh, uh, so I don't want to give a very precise statement yet, but so let's look at this, uh, whatever, loss function. Oh, so here it's a, maybe normalized. And here I take a square of a unit, as Eric called it yesterday, an activation function of uh, psi mu, what did I call this spike V? This is inner product. Okay, so depending on which phi you choose here, uh, sigmoid, whatever, uh, you will have a different model, but this is the general class of generalized linear model. Again, I discovered that there's a very nice review on this by uh, Lenka, by Barbier, uh, Florent, Macris, Miolan, and Lenka uh, last year. So what about these models? Th these correspond to the stupidest possible. It's not even yet a neural net. It's just one layer, just one output layer, right? Not even the one with the... Okay, what people call one layer is usually two layer. Two layer. This is really one layer. This is the stupidest possible thing. Perception. This is kind of perception. Here you have a nonlinear thing, which whatever you want. And this is not convex. It has to be smooth. What? Yeah, phi is smooth. So you need three derivatives and some condition on it. You're talking about left is like a teacher. Like yes, yes, it's a, more a teacher. Yeah, you're right. This is what it is. Okay, but it's better than tensor PCA. Then the first step. All right, so what's the story? You have again the question of roughness of the landscape and dynamics in the landscape. So this is being finished. This is by uh, Julio, Antoine Maillard, and myself. And this is by the same culprits, uh, Jagannath, Gesari, and myself. So what's the story? The, so what we can do is com compute the complexity of this, the topological complexity, right? The formula are just horrendous, but you can. Determining exactly this kind of, so you have, and let's say you are, we are also on the sphere, so we have the same prior. So you also have this question of entropy at the, at the equator. Understanding the landscape of the complexity really for the moment we have a formula, we have formulas depending on the activation phi. The variational problem that are behind this are for the moment horrendous, but I at least we can say that uh, in many cases the complexity is exponential. But to have a picture like this where you, where you have you know, some, uh, this very neat picture where all the complexity is around the equator or around the parallel near the signal. So is it only complex when phi is non-monotonic? Yes. 
Because otherwise it's tricky. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, so if you want, I can show you the picture, the, the formula, but uh, you don't want. So let me say, how does it work? You do the Katz Rice formula for this, it transforms into a random matrix problem. And what is the random matrix problem? Something in the, in the other class of random matrices that we know, which are sample covariance matrices, right? Matrices of the form uh, X, D transposed X, where X is Gaussian. Okay, so the, these spectra, this is the Marchenko Pasteur type of thing. We understand the spectrum well enough to do all this. By the way, so the, fin the, the Katz Rice formula is in itself, we are very lucky to be able to apply it. The Katz Rice formula normally is only established in the Gaussian context. These are, this thing is not Gaussian. Oh, but I didn't say, I assume these guys to be IID Gaussian. So this is not really a Gaussian thing, but it's a function of a Gaussian field. And for functions of Gaussian field, you can extend the Katz Rice formula. So if you put all that together, you have a formula for the complexity of this. In this paper with uh, Julio and Gregory, which is essentially, should be essentially of the same nature of that, depending on your phi. Yeah? I'm sorry? E, these, yeah, these guys are vectors, of course. Yeah. V is the spike, the one you want to find. I know, but just one vector. Just one vector, like, like here, it's the North Pole. Okay. What? I is mu. Yeah, of course. I is mu. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry for that. Uh, my mu is always I, but here I, I took it in a physics paper. It's mu. But, uh, all right. So this is for this thing. Now about the dynamics in this landscape. So we have something. We also have. A, so I will just say that in words. We have something of exactly the same nature. That is, there's a. It's also it, when I mean under the right conditions on phi. You also have a th diverging threshold. So you also have a large gap. I'm not sure we have the optimal gap, because the optimal gap, at least in some models, is kind of understood. But, but for exactly, so the, the, and, and the reason you have this gap is exactly the same. The one we had before, that is the gradient in the region of me escaping mediocrity is difficult. The gradient of this thing, when you are around the equator, the region of maximal entropy, the gradient is really small. So you need, in fact, let's say, let's put it this way, Lie brackets with the other vector fields in order to move away, right? So, and this cost, so this, you need a large lambda for that, and this is what we prove in this uh, uh, context here, and I will, I, I won't give you the formula except if you insist, and I will stop here.